Hey guys, thanks for coming out. How's everyone doing today? Um, we're excited to be here speaking at SIGGRAPH and um, kind of just dive right in. So my name is Justin Puda. I'm executive producer and partner at Rocket Lab and I've been in the effects and animation space for the better part of about 15 years and working primarily with Houdini for about the last five to 10. Yeah. I'm Ben Watts. Uh, I'm from Swan Hill in Australia. Uh, probably almost been using Houdini now for 10 years, which seems pretty crazy, but uh, that's, it is what it is. <laughs> I, uh, I, I'm the creative director and, and partner at Rocket Lab. Yeah, so Ben and I, we had been working together for a number of years and it just made sense to partner up about, say a couple of years ago now. Yeah. Um, and kind of had um, Ben come with Rocket Lab and become partner and that's really allowed myself to transition away to off the tools and more be in a producer role. Um, that lets me really kind of help bridge the gap between client and, and directors and whatnot with our Houdini centric team being able to kind of speak to both worlds. So yeah. um, with that, kind of pop into what we're going to talk about today, which is really taking a little bit of a look at our decision making process when it comes to problems and solutions and different work that we do at Rocket Lab. Um, yeah, we, uh, you know, oftentimes when we work with new artists or, or juniors and, and people like that, uh, your natural instinct when it comes to effects work can oftentimes be to try and simulate everything. Uh, and, you know, simulation's amazing and the tools provided uh, in Houdini are incredible. Uh, but, you know, there is that other world of proceduralism and, you know, today we're just going to have a bit of a look at how we do things at Rocket Lab. You know, we're always trying to make everything lean, efficient and, and quick so we can iterate for our clients. Um, so yeah, we're gonna we're gonna dive into a lot of different uh, scenes, different topics today, and, and just have a look at how we do things at the studio. Yeah, because I think one of the big things from a producer side, when you're working with artists and you're also working with you know uh, clients and creative, is understanding how to work with Houdini and make it lean and nimble to be able to work with a client and work at the whim of a director who wants to change things quickly on the fly and making sure that our team is set up to be able to operate and create these effects quickly and with art directability and just nice lightweight systems and trying to approach things on a case by case basis that yeah. you, know, you may not always um, consider when you're starting in Houdini. Yep. So uh, Justin and I were lucky enough this year to get a little bit of time aside from client work, uh, which never happens. And uh, we had some of the team take on some of that work while we created a bespoke short film just for this uh, this presentation, and uh, you know no one's ever seen it before. This is this is it, so uh, you know we're really excited to get the opportunity to do this. We had a lot of fun creating it, and uh, yeah, this is we're going to break this bad boy down and and have a look at how we went about it. So enjoy. Thank you. At least two hours work went into that. Yeah, just a little bit. <laughs> um, so yeah, we're basically like Ben said, we made the film as you know, a passion project for ourselves and also to create kind of a case study that we could really showcase some of our decision-making process across some of the effects that were produced within the film, so. Yeah, we're, we're not gonna go into every note obviously and break it down at a molecular level, but we are going to dive into a lot of uh, a lot of the shots and scenes, and hopefully open some eyes up to you know just a different way of thinking, and you know the different ways you can use simulation, proceduralism, and then combine them to you know level up your effects. 
So with that, <clears throat> we'll drive right in. Um, the first system we're gonna look at was our bubble system. And this was um, kind of part of this decision-making came from, we had a project that we did for Bud Light earlier this year where we had a lot of vellum um, large bubble simulations and they required just a lot of uh, real hero collisions going on and quite a high quantity of bubbles. Yeah, um, like, uh, and, and the behavior had to be very, um, Directed. Yep, very directed, and uh, yeah, uh, the collision side of it was was just uh, really heavy, um, and you know, you sort of hit a wall pretty quick when you need a lot of bubbles in that scenario. So, yeah, we wanted something lightweight. Yeah, and to make it, you know, part of the biggest problem was the director really wanted to really hone in on where and how these bubbles would move. So when we approached our bubble system, having that kind of knowledge from the previous job. We knew we wanted to do something simple that was lightweight um, and really art directable. So we'll dive right in and kind of look at the system that we built. Um, so we have a, just a basic pop system. Um, it's really quite lightweight. And for us, we didn't need collision of the actual bubbles. We just needed them to be able to collide with our anchor. And ultimately we wanted to have uh, the ability to easily distribute it across multiple sims so that we could create uh, hero bubbles, you know, the micro bubbles, and some of those medium scale bubbles within our pop simulation. And that ultimately gave us control uh, at an art direction standpoint where we could really tweak it per shot yeah. quickly and not have to be waiting for heavy simulations from Vellum um, by still having all the, the things that we needed out of it. Yeah, and I just found it was easy to establish, you know, P scale ahead of time before we went into pops just to give us, you know, something to, as, a, as a collision basis. You know, it didn't have to be accurate, just know, a shape that was, um, or a size, I should say, that was just a kind of a medium to small size, you know, so very, very simple. And then from there, we, you know, we had just um, the desire to be able to really control what the bubbles look like, because they need to not look just like a simple sphere. They needed to have this motion as if, you know, they're almost like scuba diver bubbles or something kind of floating up in the pushing water. Pushing and pulling. Pull. Yeah, pushing and pulling. So, we just used a simple anti-alias flow noise to create a nice looping, um, deforming bubble and displacement setup. And that gave us the ability to really control and art direct it however we wanted to and really have an infinite amount of options for our bubbles, whether they were the hero bubbles, the medium bubbles, or the small bubbles. And really let us have all those different variations and controls on the fly, nearly real time, to, to flex on each shot how they needed to be. And then kind of wrapping up with this section, you know, we just take those multiple simulations and we layer them all together. And that ultimately gives us a look that we were happy with. We could control independently um, for each type of simulation with their own forces and, and behaviors. And then like Ben had mentioned, using some of that kind of initial P-scale and distance-based masking, we were really able to make sure that no particles were interpenetrating with our anchor and have just some basic collision setups. Um, yeah, the, ma scenes. the masking was was good because anything that didn't solve correctly in terms of collision just got taken care of when it got in proximity to the anchor or the chain and just got effectively scaled down to zero. So it was just, yeah, again, a very simple solution that allowed for a ton of bubbles, a ton of detail when, you know, it's not really a hero object. So we didn't have a lot of time to muck about. So no. it worked well. All right, so uh, ne next we're going to talk about the fish flocking system. Uh, this was interesting because when I initially started to think about this, again, we didn't have a lot of time to develop it. I thought, you know, we'd potentially go like a particle route and do some flocking and, you know, the usual sort of uh, paths you might think you'd take, right? But uh, the more I thought about it, you know, w we had – quite an, uh, an explicit positioning, like where we wanted to, to put the flocks and how we wanted to shape them and things like that. And I quickly realized that if we do pops, like that's not gonna take into account any of the body flex or anything, like yeah. it's gonna be a dumb system. Uh, and, you know, I had to think about this and I said to Justin, what if we did a curve based system? Um, we just build a rig and we just run these guys uh, along some paths and build in some shaping controls and it worked out really good and it was almost real time. So that's the way we went with that one. So we're going to just dive in there and have a look at how we did it. Uh, we just start off with a simple line and you just distribute this where you need to place it in the scene, of course. Add some basic 3D noise to shape it. It just goes into a sweep and 
essentially this will define how many fish you want. And this thing can take hundreds of fish, no problem. But the best part about it is we can just shape it, pinch it, twist it, you know, do all this stuff to the actual, to define the flock, you know, and put it wherever we want, essentially. Um, and then we, we just add some gentle looping 3D noise on it to, you know, give it the feel that it's, you know, being pulled by a current or it's floating in the ocean. Just that secondary motion, which is nice. Uh, and, yeah, it's just, it's real, really a, a simple solution, I think. But with this also, it didn't have to be, it's not a hero piece. You know, it's no. background, okay. mid to background. But it's it's almost real time. And, yeah, I mean, it's just an example of how you could go another way instead of like. Yeah, it lets us like really control how we want to shape each of these flocks and these schools of fish and whether we want to. At some point we had like a hundred of these fish in a scene, but it just came down to let us do really art direct quickly and not be dealing with, you know, heftier simulations yeah. where we're having to tweak or change things and ultimately give us like multiple layers of animation on top of um, just a fairly simple situation. Yeah, and I'm way too impatient to wait for that. So, yeah. <laughs> um, so in this video here, it's, you know, we wanted to obviously have a uh, variable P scale and timing offsets and all that to make it feel more organic. So we're able to just offset um, each fish along its its guide curve easily, which was, you know, uh, a simple thing to do, but obviously a critical thing to do. So we can have a look at the, the next video here. And, you know, essentially what we're doing is just defining how many frames it's going to take for it, the fish to get from the start of the curve to the end. Um, and once we've done that, we take each primitive, uh, pipe that into a random node just to get a value that we're going to add on to that initial value just to offset them randomly per primitive. Um, and then ultimately, the output of that could be, you know, something as simple as a, an offset attribute, which we can use down the line in the path to form node to um, essentially just offset the positions, each, each fish position. Down the line, you can see here in this this slide here, we've put that in, um, and yeah, just sim just simply takes care of the the offsets. Uh, so that was that was nice, um, a simple solution. And then the next thing that came up was <laughs> all the fish are the same scale. Obviously, we don't want that. So, um, and in the path to form node, if you uh, input p scale into it, what you're going to get is the squashing of the, the shape along the curve. So that's ob obviously not what we wanted. We wanted uh, variable sizes in the fish. So um, we knew that wasn't going to work uh, as is. So we uh, we essentially just used a, a SOPS for each loop, uh, reset the position of each fish, <laughs> fish back to the origin, um, gave it a, a random value, um, you know, whatever, like, whatever p-scale we desired. And then we just reverted that matrix to get it back on the path. So then when it came out the, the other end, um, we get you know, proper varied p-scale as you'd expect. And it's really just this simple solution. You know, I mean, that, that's how it all works. So once that's all done and you look at the result, I mean, I, it's, it just, it's so good to work with, like it's, fun we had a, a blast just distributing these throughout the scenes uh it wasn't grueling because there was no sims and it, i think it looks pretty good like it <laughs> for a background to mid-ground sort of uh solution um and something that you maybe wouldn't think to sort of take a procedural route worked out really well for the film so yeah yeah <clears throat> it gave us lots of options to really decide how we wanted these fish to play into the actual role of the animation for each shot and that was something that was a lot quicker and easier to do with a, a more procedural approach here. So next we'll take a look at our coral growth. Um, and in this scenario, you know, with coral, oftentimes you think of a more traditional approach where you would actually model out the coral and then simulate the coral. And neither of us are huge fans of modeling. Um, so, so lazy. We opted for a kind of a, I guess a, you could say a lazy approach, but we thought it was a clever approach because we weren't trying to mimic any real world coral within the scenes. We wanted something that was kind of otherworldly, yeah. a bit fantasy driven. So we, we just wanted something to look really organic and have a lot of variation and 
not be bogged down with modeling yeah. um, ultimately for ourselves. So what we ended up with was a solver-based method um, to create a more organic approach for the actual models. And we'll take a look at how we, how we develop that right now. Yep. So starting just with the basic circle um, and then running it into a dot net, we're using a pop interact node um, and a, a SOP solver within our dot net. And that's essentially just um, we're resampling the curves at every frame and making sure that the points are pushing themselves out away from their neighbors and that gives us these really great organic kind of shapes and feels and this allows us a lot of flexibility to how we want to kind of shape these things over and over and create variations and then from there we're just running some remesh techniques and we're going to copy you know a couple um, copies of them on top of each other just to add some more detail uh, to the overall shape. And once we get through all this, we'll essentially take it down into a simple vellum cloth sim where we actually let it create its base shape. And then we kind of let it run beyond that and we'll offset that cache in the film so that we have an asset that's already simulated and built from the ground up via vellum. Yep. So we can kind of take a look at how the process of it actually growing up into its um, base coral shape goes right now. Yeah, so as Justin said, it's just a simple vellum cloth sim. It's it's nothing special, but the thing about it was just more so getting the uh, the shaping, you know, from not much effort at all. Yeah. A couple of nodes, uh, no modeling required. Um, and we could just do so many different variants of these, but I just got, I did two. <laughs> <laughs> you can't tell. Yeah. Um, no one knows. So then from here, we've kind of, we've offset it. So we have our cache and have our pre-roll there. So now we have our kind of animated coral shape still flat and we're just going to go through and just do a few more operations on it to prepare it for yeah, the final bit asset. of thickness yeah and a bit of thickness doing some um, measure operations to create just a custom curvature map that we'll use yeah. in, in shading down the line and that's essentially the basis of the, yeah. the coral which is just a kind of a unique approach to doing something that is traditionally done yeah, procedurally or manually and really using solvers to create um, a real flexible solution to that no, it worked out well, and again, it's it's very uh, basic. But you know, you scatter these things through the scene, vary their um, their rotation, their scale, and all that sort of stuff, and you can really populate uh, the rock, the rock objects, and uh, the other stuff in the scene really quickly and easily. Yep. So next, we're going to look at the peel effect sequence, what we call the peel effect <laughs> sequence, and this is where things got a little bit more. Um, a little bit more involved. Yeah, and involved. Because we knew that we wanted to use um, a vellum simulation for the base animation of the peeling rocks. But in doing that, we also found like we wanted to add some secondary detail on top of that. And rather than try to do it all in sim, this is the first kind of case study we're going to look at that we start with a vellum simulation and then add procedural detail. Yeah, layered on essentially top. where our worlds collide. Um, yeah. You know, like taking our sim base and like augmenting that, improving upon it adding a lot more detail and uh, yeah, let's have a look. Have a look. So we start off with just a, a sphere, add a mountain to it or whatever you like, 3D noise, and it's just gonna get boronoid fractured. Um, so pre-noise the edges to um, make sure they're not so straight and boring. Uh, and uh, you know, we explode that so we can get a visual. Not all of them are straight, some are, but that's cool. Um, we're gonna use an in-house transition tool just to activate a red color across the surface. And um, this is going to bring on a lot of the, the changes in this vellum cloth sim that we're going to jump into next. So we'll dive in into vellum. Uh, so first thing we want to do in a geometry wrangle, we want to update the color every frame because it's only going to come in on the first frame if we don't do this. So we're going to update that to make sure we can use that to affect everything down the line. And one of the cool things about this is if you've ever used uh, the mass attribute, it's essentially like an activation. We can use it to keep something frozen or, or activate it when we when we like. Um, so we're doing that here just to make sure that the shape is contained until we tell it, you know, use the red color to uh, do its thing. So, so we do that and then this is really where the magic of this effect happens, if you could call it that, because uh, we're affecting the rest length here and the rest length scale at different differing values. And the look really just come from experimentation um, more so than anything. Uh, so the goal though was to get the pieces to peel back on themselves, almost like paint, old paint peeling off. Um, it was just a look I wanted to go after for this. So yeah, just uh, 
modified that with the the incoming color and um you know just added a little bit of pop drag a differing amount of pop drag per piece i believe and then the pop force was just a little bit of upward force again varying that per piece so it had the variation and that that nice feel and and wasn't uniform uh, if we have a look at the cache here we can see all the pieces coming on and uh they're doing exactly like what I was just uh, describing. They sort of peel back. Um, and uh, yeah, I was pretty happy with how this turned out. You can dial up the pieces if you want to, but I think for our, our goal here, it, it felt pretty right. Yeah. You know, we subdivided it. But um, in this next section here, this is kind of where we, we leveled it up a bit. Um, I was pretty happy with that effect as it was, but this is where we're able to bring in the proceduralism on top of the sim and keep all the good stuff that we just created without disrupting anything else. Um, yeah, and really add that extra layer of detail while retaining all the original simulation motion yeah. because we love that motion, but we just wanted a little bit more on, added on top and, and using our transition tool again, making sure that it comes on at different areas and different times so we could kind of continue our control yeah. and art directability over everything. It's all about control. Yes. So, we, we, we're going to use this transition tool again, but we're going to change the timing. We're going to change the placement. And so what we could have done here, because we wanted to break this up more, I looked at the topology and I'm like, there's a good amount of, you know, uh, there's a good amount of detail on this thing. We could have refractured it with Voronoi or any other method, but I thought let's try the cheap and dirty facet and uh, unique the points. And we we're able just to bust these guys out into their individual polygons. And I thought this was a good, good, easy solve and um, it would give us a good amount of detail. Yeah. So I did that and then um, assembled those pieces, turned them into pack prims, and then ran a few extra vops uh, on these. So what we did was we pushed them out along the normal, we spun them in random directions based on their proximity to the surface. So once they're pushed out, they would spin X amount and then we scale them. So some go down to zero, some uh, stay present in the scene and just float off. But, uh, you know, and then we just unpack them. But uh, something to note actually I didn't mention was obviously when we facet them though, we've busted up our normals at that point. So we've lost our, our good smooth normals from the, the sim prior. Just wanted to note that because in the next step uh, it's important. but. Yeah, that, they're the operations we run on that. And as you can see, like, we can maintain all the goodness from the sim beforehand. We can get a ton more detail. We can fully control what kind of behaviors we want to uh, incorporate on top of this. And I, I just think it's a, a good example of how you can layer this stuff and not always be pinned into a sim. You can just combine them and uh, do yeah. a, a bunch of other stuff. Use one to fuel the other and, yeah. and vice versa and whatnot. Yeah. So... In this next uh, video here, I'm just showing that we take that same transition from where we faceted, and it's, it's just a reference copy. And um, we need, blend in the normals. yeah, we're going to blend the normals back from because I stored them ahead of the facet, um, so I could reaccess them down the line and just blend blend them back essentially from where they're not broken, if that makes sense. So anywhere that's cracked, get the uh, get the updated normals and anywhere that's not get the old ones and then we just add some thickness to bring it all together uh, yeah and that that's like essentially that side of the, the chain yeah it's one part of the effect and really kind of where yeah. we really added that procedural layering on yep. top of the simulation based thing and we'll take a look at kind of the other side um, of this effect sequence now cool so we just jump over to this other side uh, in the network and it's essentially the same thing you know transitioning on the, uh, the peeling pieces in the vellum. Um, but the one difference here is we're adding a normal force on top of this. This is more like a traditional tear with um, the twist of the pieces like rolling back on themselves. Um, as you can see here, they get these really beautiful sort of cigar-like shapes. They roll in, all the collisions work. And it's just, again, another way that we can sort of use what we've already done, the hard work that we've done, and uh, just, I think, add another variation yep. on top. Uh, and we just go on down the line and sub D this, add some thickness. And then we've got like a second iteration that we can copy onto our point cloud uh, up ahead here and, and get just, you know, something we can scatter and, and break things up, get more variation and, and interest. 
So here we're just putting both copies onto a point cloud. Uh, and you can sort of have a look at now, we've got a good amount of detail um, and a good amount of variation in the peeling and the locations. And so now we'll take a look real quick about kind of how we created the point cloud, how we got some variable spin controls and whatnot, and ultimately kind of rounding out this effect. Yeah, so we just took a, a tube, flattened it down, uh, scatter some points on it, and just fuse the close ones for some cheap uh, non-interpenetration goodness. And then uh, just a basic 3D noise to add some underlying motion. Um, and then I created a, a distance-based um, mask from the center out, so we can just move the internal pieces at a different speed from the outer ones just to be... Uh, well, just to create some some interest, I suppose, because it's otherwise it just all spins at the same time. And then we take another copy of our original grain, but we keep that just as a solid object. So all the peeled layers will just sit on on top of that. And when they peel away, you'll see like a, you know, uh, I guess a core underneath. And you'll see that now. Um, you know, everything just folds away nicely, and we've got that internal structure that we can, you know, just shade in whatever way we want, subsurface or, you know, put some maps on there and make it look semi-interesting. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, so that, that essentially wraps up the peel section. Yeah, and it's not, you know, necessarily real time at this point because there's so much geometry in the scene, yeah. but it's still quite quick for, for how much geometry and, and, and yeah. motion and animation we have in there. It was good to work with. Um, you're never going to get real time when you, you know, pull this amount of geo, but... Um, yeah, I think just the combination of the, the sim with the procedural effects just adds a little bit to it. Yeah. So <clears throat> kind of the last um, part of this piece is our procedural jellyfish. And this is really the hero of the film and um, actually was kind of born out of a, um, an old client project of ours where we had to create just a, a very high quantity of variations of jellyfish. and. The so director many. for the yeah, just so many, um, and the director wanted to really continuously reshape and change with tentacles, oh. shapes, sizes, bell sizes, etc. And it was also needed to be put into a large swarm of jellyfish, and so this this kind of produced this interesting riddle that we had to solve, which is that you know a jellyfish has really two kind of base forms of motion. You got the the pumping of the bell, the, the jellyfish head, and you also got just kind of how it you know projects itself through a water call, and understanding how we were going to get those two to speak together because we, we had yeah. a plan to use a pop sim for our swarm but the whole riddle is almost chicken and egg where does the bell's pumping action drive a pop simulation or does a pop simulation drive yeah. the pumping action of the bell and getting that to work um, and those to speak together and also tricky. Have variable time offsets and yeah. not have duplicate copies within a scene um, was something that was quite tricky that we feel like we found a what ended up being a, a semi-simple solution to a quite kind of complex problem. I'm reliving the nightmare now. Yeah. <laughs> it was, uh, it was rough. One, yeah. uh, so we'll dive into this but we and we'll kind of break it. it down. We did solve it, yes. Uh, all right. So first we're going to start with just establishing our motion and this attribute. And the attribute is really responsible and the kind of the bedrock foundation of yeah. the entire jellyfish system. And we'll just dive right in. So Just go on in. Just dive in. Um, we start by taking the bell and we start with our bell and we just basically feed the Y component of the bell into a ramp snug. Just we'll, imagine the dome. Yeah, it's just done. Um, <laughs> it's a dome. And uh, it's like a little half dome that we got. Yeah. And it's, we're referencing the time at the soft level as well. And that's basically giving us um, the speed of our pulse. And we, we, that gives us a looping color attribute that we can then use to drive not only the motion of the bell and the displacement of the bell, but also bind that into our pulse attribute that we're going to use throughout the system all the way down into shading, um, even towards the end. So we'll see just a quick visualization of this right now. And you can see... It we, just looks so simple. Yeah, it's very simple. It's a simple Y ramp going through it. Um, but it really sets the foundation for everything that we're going to do down throughout the, line. the rest of the thing. Yep. Um, go ahead, Michael. Yeah, so um, that was all good. And once we established, like, we could use that... Uh, that ramps uh, attribute to shape the bell and you know do a bunch of stuff. We were able to just do a simple keyframe loop, and that was all good. But there was a problem, and that was the fact that this thing just ran at one speed essentially. 
and that wasn't going to be cool because you know the client didn't want that and we didn't want that so we had to figure out a way to make this thing feel a bit more organic and feel like it's alive and it can change it's like it's motion and it's speed throughout the the ocean um yeah so let's have a look at how we did that look we just honestly took a took time into a a sine wave you could do this multiple different ways but this felt pretty natural and it, it worked well for us and we just added a multiplier to time just so we could have that on the top level to to change it we just map it um you know from zero to one and we output it into a, a custom attribute called bar speed and we're gonna we're able to use that uh in a retime node after uh after this part in the network so you know, in the uh, the speed slot of the read time, we weren't able to just put in regular attributes like uh, at var speed or anything like that because it doesn't read that. So we just use an old school point expression, H script style, and it just works beautifully. Like it, it just reads in the dynamic uh, change in the attribute. And it was really that simple. Like that gave us our variable speed. You know, we can make this thing move through the, the water like it has some kind of intelligence. So, uh, that worked out really well. Um, I was just going to, were you going to say something? Yeah, I was just going to say, and we can kind of see that here, just <clears throat> still just the bell of the jellyfish and getting the bell as our foundation Yeah. to just see it kind of like we're, we're over accentuating the amount of variation we have here. Yeah, it looks like it's um, on crack or something. Yeah, <laughs> but it's, a, it's the start of the puzzle, right? And, and, and the ultimate solution. Trust me, it works. It works, <laughs> we think. <laughs> Hope. Yeah. yeah. So uh, when that's all established, now things get a little bit more interesting. Um, what we do is we're going to take the uh, the pulse attribute we established on the bell that moves through it, and we're going to use that now to drive the actual velocity of the the bell through three D space. And this is where the connective tissue between you know what we set up on the bell and how we're going to move this thing all comes together. So basically, we just take that bell, we just pack it into a single point, and uh, we, we bring it into DOPS. Now we're going to update our pulse attribute every frame, so it's dynamic, of course. So same trick you saw before, just a geometry wrangle. Um, and then we are going to establish some controls for the speed and direction. So the way we chose to do this was a little bit, well, it was informed from our previous job a little bit, so we just yeah. ran with it and kept it. But essentially, we just create two diagonal vectors. So imagine one, you know, that way, one that way. And we're going to use a sine wave to switch between them over time. And we'll have top level control on how quickly that happens. Um, but then we multiply um, those vectors with the incoming pulse attribute. We can remap them on the surface. So make, uh, you know, control our slower speed or our quicker speed this thing's going to move at. And that just goes directly into velocity. Um, yeah, so, I mean, it's... That's essentially like the the underlying driver, the motion. Yeah, that <clears throat> that essentially solved that problem of connecting the bell yeah. to our pop system and allowed us to really distribute variation across. Yep. And like we said in the original client piece, you know, a lot, a, a lot of jellyfish, um, and, and making sure that we have consistently variant variations of those jellyfish and never having any repetitive motion, which yep. was a uh, quite a problem that we had to overcome. So. Once that's done, we just use a simple uh, downward force to really like just add another organic element to it. So when the jellyfish is like pulsing up, you know, through the, the ocean, we just drag it down just slightly after each pulse. It just made it feel way more alive, more organic, and just made it, yeah, that, that little 5% better that um, just, yeah, in the end, was, it just felt more natural, I suppose. Yeah, made it feel more like it was in the ocean and yeah. the water column because you have that downward kind of gravitational drag. pull always and drag on its motion and, and ultimately yep. give us a better organic feeling. Yeah, approach. it just was a better look. So then we get into the shaping of the bell, which was something that was, um, we, we knew we had to create fully procedurally, but we also needed to keep it organic and not get into any vellum simulations or anything because we did know we needed to have some like yeah. almost cloth-like yeah, you know, um, attributes to the surface of the bell. So we didn't we didn't want to model this thing, no, and we and we no. we <laughs> we love modeling. Um, 
and uh, yeah, we didn't want to be locked into Sims. Like we wanted, you know, some frills and pillowy bits and, yep. you know, all in different areas. So we, what do we do? We went to Vops. Yeah, and ultimately we needed to make lots of variants of this thing. So many So variants. because we knew that the client kept wanting to make all these variations, we ended up building a pretty robust system, but it ended yeah. up just being just a multitude of layer of Vops um, yeah. and displacements that we were able to create different controls and get all that built in. So we're gonna run through it. Um, copy through and it. paste. A lot of copy and paste, yeah. Um, just kind of starting at the top, we, you know, we're doing everything with normals and just Y ramps on all of our displacements. And Look that's at the really speed on that. controlling everything quickly. Um, and basically, you know, we just start with some bell frill settings and some top noises just to kind of give us some displacements um, right off the bat. And as we go down, we're gonna basically create our internal core of the jellyfish because we knew we needed to have a separate entity from the internal and external. Yeah. Um, and having that gave us controls to have more frill on the inside um, to kind of expand the inside away from the outer um, core of the jellyfish and really give us a lot of flexibility both in motion, animation, and shading ultimately uh, when it came down the line. So from there, we're just gonna kind of run down the line. You're gonna see a few more of these VOP nodes that we're um, running more displacement operations on. And that just gave us all the tools and flexibility we needed to to really have the controls in place where we could kind of be flexible at the whim yep. of the director um, and their needs for the constant reshaping of the jellyfish. That's it. Um, after this, we're gonna go down and we'll see kind of some of the attributes and masks that we've got set up that are gonna help us with shading down the line and also creating the tentacles, uh, which is kind of the final step of the puzzle. Um, yeah, oh, we still got cops. We still got cops, yeah. Yeah. So the pulse attribute here, again, just showing it's still being used. We're gonna use that all the way down through shading. And then we'll have some inner mask setups where we can kind of separate the inner and the outer core of the bell. And then also just the bottom edge mask that we'll use for some shading attributes down the line. Yeah, that's it. I mean, all these attributes are really handy to have in shading as well, as Justin mentioned. So that's pretty much like the core, I guess, of you know, the, core the, of the bell. Yeah. Uh, we got cops next, right? Yep. So this was cool. Um, you know, you guys have seen how much topologies on that bell. There's not a lot, right? And I knew that if we subdivided that thing even three more times, there's nowhere near enough detail to get veins and like the cool little details that I wanted to add in there. So I'm like, we've got to make some like topology independent business here. So, uh, you know, we turned to good old cops. So let's have a look at our workflow for that. So let's just jump back up to where we added the thickness earlier and we can just blast out the, uh, the uh, internal part of the jellyfish here and uh, we're just going to remesh this because we're going to run a shortest path on it and get some vein action and um, you know if you've used shortest path you know um, you know having quads is not going to yield the best results so first of all we're just going to pack the bell and project a point up to the top middle of the thing that'll give us like the start group of points for our, our shortest path then we'll just create some other candidate points and call the group end and just let it do its thing and we get this pattern here, which I'm sure you've all seen, but it really works well for like details and veins and such. So ran with that, smoothed it out a bit, um, add some UVs, and then we're just gonna slap that down into UV space. Uh, this is gonna work well because once it's here, we can resample it, um, you know, add some extra 3D noise to it along the length from the center out or whatever, you can mask it however you like. Um, I think I just did a distance based thing, but, um, you know, use some ramps and add some actual mass to create fall off. And then once we've got it flattened out the UV space, we can bring this in just like a texture map. We've got infinite detail essentially now. Um, we can um, sample this thing and determine how thick we want it. That's a bit far. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, you can see like it can be whatever you really need there. And then um, we can have a look at how this is actually done once we get inside this um, this VOP in COPS. So that's a lot of OPS. So um, just essentially using an XYZ dist uh, function and a prim UV and in the, the geometry file path, we're just sampling in that flattened SOPS um, null to bring this guy in. Um, what we can do here is just take a copy, spin it around and they just composite these two layers together and we get a really detailed version of this 
thing that almost looks like an eyeball, not an eyeball, but you know what I mean, cornea or whatever it is. And, and then uh, we can either expand or contract it. And essentially this will get piped back out into your shader. And uh, while our render time, you get all that extra detail that is nothing to do with the original topology really in the end, it's just, it's fully independent. And that was a control uh, that we wanted. So it was a good solve. Yeah, and it also gave us the ability to then add all that detail and still use our attributes like our pulse attribute to drive, you know, uh, streaks of light down the veins and different things like that that we knew that we were going to need. You could do a lot with it. Yeah. So then last is the kind of the... Tentacles. The tentacles. It's almost the, the most basic of all the, the yeah. things. But this is a situation where, you know, what makes the most sense is a simulation. Um, yep. I'm doing a simple vellum hair sim because the tentacles are just... Um, that's the perfect solve for it. So yep. essentially we start with the bell and we're just gonna um, basically blast out and just have our interior of our bell. And we'll scatter some points on that and we'll use the attribute interpolate node to kind of transfer that motion of the bell back onto our points um, that we'll be pinning the hairs to. And we're just gonna create um, some simple lines with, um, that we're gonna be attaching into it and have our p-scale already set up on our points so that it gives us some nice variation across our tentacles and the growth of our tentacles within the scene. So we can see here now, we'll just run through just like a quick scrub showing that pin motion uh, within the scene before we go into our actual vellum simulation. Yeah, this is just testing it moving along and being pinned where we need it to be. Yeah, and then um, once we get into our vellum sim here, and we'll, we'll play that back, I think probably the most noodly part of the whole project was getting our tentacles to feel to fly right properly. and float right within the, ah, the scene they, because um, yeah, it's... They, <laughs> It's a bit tough to, to get it to feel like it's not getting pulled by the bell yeah. too much, but still feels like it's got weight in the scene and it's flowing yeah. in, in the, the water column. And in, in That's the right. It was a little bit fiddly, but we got there in the end and got the bell coll collider as well. So it, there's no interpenetration there. It all works as expected. And um, we just resample them. So we've got a ton more detail at render time, technical p-scale along the, the curve view plus color. Sort of brings it all together. And that takes us kind of towards the end here where we can just see a quick flip book of the final jellyfish put together with its animation. Um, here you can see the variable speed. So, you know, it starts off a little faster then it just drifts off. And then it kicks off again and then it cuts off because I probably screwed up the flip book. There we go. <laughs> but, um, yeah. I and mean, that's, that's basically the, the, the end of the, the full jellyfish. And we can just kind of check out a summary of this is that, you know, Again, just starting with something as simple as just a half dome for yep. the base model and creating that pulse attribute and loop at the top, it let us drive that all the way through to create our variable speed, connect that motion of the bell into a pop simulation, sh you know, shape the bell using bobs, yep. create the extra detail using cops, and then finish with the bell and Harrison. So something that is a quite complex motion had a whole lot more proceduralism, but still layering in simulation when it made the most sense to use those tools in the right place. Yep, that's it. That's 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 all. Thank you, guys. Thank you. If you have any questions, hit us up. Hit them up right now. Any questions? Come on, don't be scared. <laughs> Let it all sink in. Let those questions float to the surface. You want that film? Yeah. Of course we can. You can play it all day. I didn't put in two days' work for nothing. <laughs> <laughs> all right, right, we'll play it again. Um, so I have a question regarding like, how did you guys map the texture that you created in Cobbs back to the geometry? Did you like change the UVs of the bulb of the jellyfish? Uh, to a radial coordinate, or like, how did you do that? Sorry, I forgot about that. I'm good, aren't I? Um, it would have worked with the UVs that I had originally, but I believe I did establish another set of UVs specifically for that. Yeah, it's likely that it would have been just some top-down mapping, just to you know, because it's a pretty simple shape, so it wasn't hard to get it down into UV space and have good distribution. But yeah, we use that a lot. You know, it's it's a good thing to do if you can get good good UVs on your object. Um, 
yeah, you can do some serious damage with that thing. It's good. <laughs> and you probably added the UV attribute before the animation so that it doesn't move or the you made the veins move with the mesh. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, you can establish it after and time shift and attribute copy it back. Uh, even if it's animated, that's something that, you know, pops up a lot as well. You know what I mean? Like just if it's animated, just freeze it off to the side and pull it back in because it's, it's always going to be the same topology. So it'll transfer back. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Awesome. No Thank worries. You. Thanks, man. So we'll pause questions for a minute and then replay the video. Got it. Yep. Yeah, by request. Yeah, sure. Yeah. It was better the second time. <laughs> Good the first time. Amazing the second time. Uh, Any other questions? You. Yeah. Where did I render it or how? I was Redshift. Um, yep. Question or Redshift. Um, I had a question on your um, pulse setup. Sure. Um, if you're using the sine wave to drive the pulse, um, mm -hmm. did it reset from zero to one after, like when the sine would go into the minus range or, um, did it go from the top back to the bottom? And if so, how did you get it to reset each time? Yeah, that, that was where we did the loop, like the keyframes after that was set up and made a loop of it. And then that went into the variable speed after the fact. Does it, did that answer your question? Yeah, I guess I missed that part. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm sure I, I think I said that. I hope I said that. Oh, yeah, sorry if I didn't. <laughs> okay. But yeah, we um yeah we we set up the bell to get the shaping and the pulse right, and then we we keyed it and looped it so it was seamless, and then we progressed to the variable speed and everything else after that. So it was like a, a stable base, and you could just yeah have it. You could just do whatever you want with it after that. Did you key it in VOPS? In the VOP node? Um, I believe it was just, yeah, it was the ramps. Yeah, the the ramps offset was the parameter, I believe, that was promoted to top level in SOPs. Got it. Thank and you. Keyed, yeah. No Great, thank you. Cheers. Yeah. Actually, before we get to your question, I'm just going to do one quick photo for the team back home. Say hello, everybody. Hi. Um, hey. I don't know if I missed it. Well, thank you. That was amazing. Thank you very much. Um, I don't know if I missed it in the in the anchor setup for the. Uh, did, were you guys using the anchor as the emitter of the particles or? Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah so did um, all emission, I believe, yeah, come from the anchor because you know I had the chain attached to it as well. Yeah. Which um, I don't know if you noticed, but that was procedural animation as well. Um, was another actual part where we could have done either or but I did it procedurally um actually was originally going to talk about that and we're like it's not cool enough <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was cool but I'm a nerd so you know yeah so um it did like just a just a changing noise pattern over the anchor um yeah and uh did it like that it's pretty straightforward and then you said you used the anchor as a mask so that the bubbles wouldn't go through the anchor itself yeah, as well? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. did some just distance calculations and things. And um, we emitted um, from the anchor, a version of the anchor was just a little bit puffier, um, you know, to keep it off the surface originally in P scale over age or something, like something simple. 
And yeah, just did it like that. Thank you. No worries. Over there, yes. Uh, come this way. What was your uh, ideation process for this piece? I said to Justin, I think an anchor will look good falling to the bottom of the ocean. <laughs> I'm not even kidding. It was very deep. Um, and then I was like, I'm going to do like a tornado that comes up out of the sand. And then I started, I'm like, shit, I'm not, I'm not going to do that. And then... I went back to it and yeah, it actually that part was actually really straightforward. But like it just, I did literally come to you and I'm like, anchor, sand, let's do it. And then you're know, like, fish flocks and seaweed and stuff, grass, <laughs> seagrass. Seagrass, yeah, yeah. He's like, I live near parts of the ocean where there's all this seagrass. I'm like, what's that? And then <laughs> we, um, yeah, we did built stuff and like, it was just, I don't know, We did, like I said, we had some time away from the client work. We just kind of went to town and just had fun with it, you know? Yeah, and I think... He said more intelligent things. Right? You know, um, yeah, well, it did start with the anchor, that's yeah. for sure. But beyond that then, it just became kind of like a, a passion project of me. Um, also, I was trying to push on Ben to create <laughs> heavier scenes and harder details um, throughout the process. and. You just kept saying more detail. I just kept saying more detail, more detail. And um, it just ended up being what it came out to be, which is, uh, I guess you could say it's an ode to our, my love for the ocean and yep. Ben's love for the anchor. <laughs> <laughs> it's so true. I just, something I've got to say, the anchor was made from a JPEG. I just, I'm not even kidding. I'm like, I've got to make an anchor, but I'm so lazy. I might want to get a JPEG, put it in trace node extrude do some things noise done and then yeah it was good we don't like the model yeah <laughs> model no so yeah that's pretty much it hi everyone um vfx artists here mostly compositing hey for such a complicated i mean it got very complicated at the end for me and as a compositor, I'm always looking into a way to integrate Houdini into my pipeline. Sure. How would I composite this, let's say, with a live footage? How, what, what would be the process? What would be the passes that you would be giving me? With such complicated models, if I have to do iterations, if the clients call again and want to do changes, how, how do I get to put Houdini with the rest of what I work with? For example, I work with Nuke or After Effects. How do I integrate all of this with it? Um. So do you mean like once, like in our case, if once we've rendered that out, like what passes will we have and what you would have to work with? Is that what you mean? Um, more like in my case, just trying to put it simple is um, if you were done with the model yep. and were to give it to me to composite it with, um, with let's say, a live, a live footage. Oh, okay. Yep. Now, what would, Sorry. Be the, what, would be, what would be the passes? What would be the process? How would you approach this? Because usually when I try it, we end up spending, doing a lot of back and forth and wasting a lot of time doing so. Especially Udini. Yeah. Let's grab the tiny mic. Um, you know, I think with anything underwater specifically, you know, you're going to have a little bit of a tricky solve getting a, a camera solve on an underwater scene. But ultimately, from once you've kind of solved that and you've gotten the renders out, it's just kind of standard compositing passes yeah. um, and matching lighting and, yep. and kind of, you know, we use the standard layered approach to compositing. So, we would really just kick out kind of everything we can everything we can from a compositing standpoint if we have to match it to live action footage making sure we have a boatload of mats yeah um, we did a ton of masks and mats in that um we always do um all the passes broken out basically multi-pass exrs and stuff um but yeah just get all the data you can out of it especially when you're trying to match it with footage the more data you have the more kind of render passes you have, I think the better um, yeah. control and flexibility you can have in comp um, outside of a just a pure CG scene. And the fastest way to process it would be to match this with, let's say, a raw footage or to have the raw footage corrected and then match um, the object to the footage. 
think that would probably come down to like the production pipeline. Um, <clears throat> Really easiest would be, it really it really comes down to who's doing color. You know, how are you doing color on that raw footage? If you're, <clears throat> excuse me, if you're managing color yourself, then you can kind of make those those judgment calls. But if you're having to match it against, you know, let's say show footage, it's going to go out to a color house. Uh, oftentimes, if we can, we'll try to get some sort of a rough grade back from the color house so we can have some idea. But it really is a on a case by case basis as to. Who's doing final color? Do they want the the graded shots coming from us directly, or yeah. getting kind of integrated into the live action footage? Well, if it were coming from you directly, like you you get to to take the call. That's a good question. Um, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, That's yeah. what I struggle with every day. I think it, it, I I'll, I answer with like. Um, a semi answer I'll say if you know depending on the footage if the footage is like real high quality already and we we don't look at it like we're going to have to do any really heavy grade work we'd probably try to match the the renders as much as we can in in Houdini so that we're not trying to rely majorly heavily on manipulating those renders in post um, the more we can do in camera and in Houdini to match it the better for us all right thank you guys other questions Yeah, I was just wondering um, a little bit about some of the other elements in the film, like the sand coming up around the anchor or even the seagrass. Were those other cases where you guys debated between simulation or proceduralism? So sand tornado, axiom baby, all day. Love that solver. Um, it was it was a particle driven core. So did the forces uh, with the particle sim in the, the sort of tornado-esque motion and then emitted from that. Um, you know, it had additional debris and stuff like that that went up with it as well. You would have noticed, like, it comes up almost out of the sand and tried to match those pieces with what was in the, the mega scan sand texture, which was the underlying base. Um, so, you know, that one was, like, pretty much cut and dry. Like, we couldn't really do that any other way. It had collisions with the anchor and the chain and all that sort of stuff. Um, did you, you said the seagrass? Yeah, the seagrass too. Yeah. How that yeah, so that was like a, um, sort of like, uh, we built a couple base elements that are pretty much tubular and pretty basic with some variations on the different pieces. And they were just essentially just scattered with random rotations, you know, the usual kind of scattery workflow. Um, but the grass, like the coral was more distributed on a per model basis, but the seagrass actually now thinking was um, done in big clusters than uh, simmed in vellum. So yeah, it was it was way more interactive than the coral pieces. They were more like their own entity and then scattered on, but the grass really interacted and had proper collisions with, you know, various things like passing fish or, you know, other things in the scene. But yeah, that's pretty much what it was. It was pretty uh, straightforward in that sense. Cool. Thank you. No worries. I think there was one over here, yeah. Two over here. He was first. Um, caustics, are they rendered or did you also use any procedural methods to get them? The caustics are a, um, so they're redshift spotlights with textures that I built in cops with layered walling noises. Um, they're, quite layered there's quite a few um different ones but the ratio spotlights are insane like they produce in my opinion like they're a really good soul for something like that it went on obviously everything the rocks the ob every, every object in the scene so you know i tried a few different things but that seemed to be the one that um looked the best and had a lot of control in the spotlights as well like with um being able to like really dial up how hot the caustics were and everything. We kept it pretty sedate in the end, but yeah, that's that's how we did it. And Good uh, old cops. Also, the follow-up question: the god rays, are they uh, nuked or what was the no, approach? No, no, just the same lights. Yep. So they all come from the same lights. Um, the caustics and the rays, yeah, are one and the same. But you you can control them uh, independently if you like. Yeah. It was, uh, Turned out to be a pretty robust solution. I thought I'd, I'd never done underwater before, um, so this was a 
a different world for me. Um, yeah, I really enjoyed it. And there's definitely certain things that you got to take into consideration when you're trying to get that feel. Um, there's also like a lot of debris floating in every scene. I don't know if you noticed, but there's tons of like little pieces and they all like rotate and animate. They're not just static, just like being pushed around by 3D noise and bending and twisting. And yeah, so there's, there's a few objects in there. God, thank you. No worries. Um, sorry, I may have missed this while you guys were talking, but like okay. um, for the breakdown of the fish, yep. I noticed there was a note that said tail section. Yep. Was that referring to the movement of like the fish's tail or what was that note referring to, I guess? What was it called? Sorry. Tail section. Tail section. Yeah. Um, yeah. So we didn't show the actual fishy himself, but yeah, it was just a crappy turbo squid model <laughs> <laughs> and it was so bad like I was thinking god I hope no one actually gets to see this thing without motion blur um but we just put a um you know the ripple node I don't know mm -hmm. if you yeah it's we just did that on the on the tail and I was like down to do something more intricate it just looked good so yeah it was it was probably something like that and if it was like a vop or something I can't remember that we might have done something more bespoke for maybe like the side fins and things like that. But essentially, yeah, probably just some 3D noise or something very basic. Did but, you like add detail to it where all of the fish were like in sync with each other or were they like random? What, what was that? Sorry. How we offset the fish, the motion so they aren't um, all moving together. Oh. Uh, yep. Um, just being the distribution of the offset. Right? Yeah, yeah. We so we they um, we we could put on different um, variations of the actual core fish model. Um, in the end, I don't think we even did because um, I probably you know I'm always about variation and trying to like vary up everything where I can. But in this case, um, yeah, I think we had the offset along the paths, which helped split that up, um, and then. Yeah, with the P scale and everything else that was going on, I probably would have made a judgment call, like watched it back as I do. And like if I can see something's working and, you know, we can get away with you know, not having to go down the rabbit hole, I will. So, yeah, I'd, in in the, in case of the final, I, I don't think we did like bring in a different iteration and, and distribute that on the paths. But, I mean, you know, if it was more hero and closer to the the camera, I would have, but... Yeah. Thank you. No worries. All right. Well, thank you very much, guys. Amazing, amazing work. Thank you. We appreciate it. Thanks for coming out.